Hey everyone, and welcome to another week of O oh Ship. This week, I've got a really interesting new guest on. I just had the chance to meet him recently. He's the kind of guy you want to be friends with because he's clearly very clever and very interesting, and I think going to be a lot of fun for you guys to get to know. His name is Keith Tier, and he's an English American technology entrepreneur that has founded a heck of a lot of companies, exited numerous ones along the way, including taking a company public, and it's resulted in basically becoming a prolific investor, trusted board member for a lot of different technology firms around the world, and frankly, a passionate guide to startups through Comedies Accelerator, which has brought companies to life like TechCrunch or Egeo or even weblogs.com for the masses. He most recently became the founder and CEO of SignalRank, which is a very innovative and potentially disruptive investment platform that I'm sure we'll get into today. And in the brief time I've got to know Keith, bluntly it's become very clear he gets a kick out of blowing up traditional capitalism, a little bit of punk rock capitalism, if you will. So today we're going to talk about a wide range of subjects from what Keith is interested in and learned as an investor and an entrepreneur and how he's tried to use technology to break down walls for the betterment of society. So with that, let's go. Keith, welcome to Ship. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, but I'm on my second cup of coffee, so that's good. That, that's good. So you're pumped up. Good. Hopefully caffeinated coffee. So I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into that big brain of yours today. So I'd love to jump right into it. In the intro, I talked to a little bit about how you kind of like to rage against the norm a bit. And as a fellow British American, even though you have a far better accent than I do, I'm really intrigued with how you grew up, how you got into tech, and how the hell you ended up in Silicon Valley after all that time. So can you share a little bit of your story there? Yeah, I think the common theme is escaping from prison, <laughs> um, uh, broadly speaking. I grew up in the north of England in a beautiful town called Scarborough. In the 1950s, when I was born, the authorities didn't really want poor people living in the town because it would offend the tourists. And I grew up in Eastfield in a council house for Americans. It's basically a better version of a project. I don't want to paint it as being uh, terrible, but it was modest. And I kind of grew up with a chip on my shoulder. I think a couple of things drove that. One is my dad worked for the Secret Service. And uh, like all good teenagers, I took the opposite point of view. And secondly, the... England's very, especially then, very obvious class differences. So I used to look at the TV, the BBC, and see pictures of the Queen and the royal family and think how unfair it was that just because of where someone was born completely dictated their economic circumstance. So I was a bit angry. I was quite angry, actually. When you're angry, you always take the side of the underdog and you always want to change things. I can remember watching pictures of British troops in Northern Ireland on a black and white TV during the civil rights period there with policemen hitting little old ladies. And, you know, naturally you think little old lady needs protection. You take her side. So I was always a bit of a rebel. And so I ended up going to what was called Scarborough Boys High School, which was a grammar school yeah. where from being in the soccer team at my first school, Grammar schools play rugby, so I end up being in the rugby team. People don't understand how specific this is in England. You know, depending on your class, everything is different. So I started to feel like I could make it in the other guy's world. That's basically what happened. I started to believe in myself a bit. When you go to high school, you have to apply for university in your first semester. And the teacher told me not to bother because I'd come from the B stream. He said, you're probably not going to go to university. And up until that point, I hadn't really thought about whether I wanted to. And the minute he said that, I was absolutely determined I was going to university and did, although I had to do an extra year. I struggled to catch up from the negatives of being in the B stream, but I did eventually catch up and went to Canterbury. Where, where my dad's from. Oh, there you go. Another lovely city. Um, <laughs> Canterbury's great. Uh, actually, they just gave me an honorary doctorate last year. Um, cool. 
So I went to Canterbury and was a rebel there. I studied political science and sociology. Why? Because, as you said, I wanted to destroy capitalism. and <laughs> But I didn't want to blow it up with bombs. I wanted to blow it up with ideas. Um, Love that. Loved doing political science and sociology, but couldn't really resist the rebel bit of me. So in my first year, I got expelled. Um, my dad got cut, kicked out of Canterbury's boys school. It seems like some pretty good entrepreneurs got chucked out of pretty good schools back at Canterbury back in yeah. the day. <laughs> I was expelled because I organized a boycott of exams because I thought it was unfair that the entire year could be failed if you failed the statistics paper. Yeah. It was somehow like every other paper didn't matter, but if you fail statistics, you fail the whole year. And statistics was compulsory. So I did an exam boycott saying it should be optional and you should be able to fail it just like any other paper and your overall mark should determine. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I was a Hegelian. So the idea that numbers mattered was alien to me. What mattered was ideas. Hegelian logic goes back to the Greeks, especially Plato and Socrates, all of them really. So I was offended by the idea that something was only meaningful if you could put numbers against it yeah. um, because ideas live before their proof. So if you have to prove something first, that kills almost every idea. So how did you take the things that you were learning there? You clearly had an issue with the class system that existed in the UK. Like, you know, how do you try and change things? Well, it's confusing at first when you're young. You just lash out, really. It's not as considered as it needs to be. I actually became a Marxist. I read Marx. Wow. And by the way, I loved Marx. I thought Marx was a revelation. No one who's ever read Marx probably thinks he's just some crazy revolutionary okay. who's irrelevant. But actually, if you read what he wrote, I mean, he was part of the Enlightenment tradition with Saint-Simon and Hobbes, Locke, Mill, Rousseau, earlier and you know smith and ricardo and economics he was part of the scene he wasn't separate from it. Mm -hmm. it to me it was incredibly enlightening to understand where capitalism came from by the way no one realizes this but he was a huge fan of capitalism he thought capitalism was the best system the human race has so far come up with to allocate resources he thought it was the product of a division of labor that was very efficient at allocating resources and his criticism of it was nothing to do with whether it was good. It was whether it could continue to be good. <laughs> uh, and so I found it a revelation and I got very active in politics through that. I ran anti-racism movements. I ran a Troops Out of Ireland style movement. You probably see this picture behind me of a, a Bengali woman on this yeah. side, that side. This is Afia Begum who was 19, came to England, having been married to a husband who was British. He died the week she landed and the British government wanted to deport her. And I fought a whole campaign to keep her in the country. So I was doing all kinds of stuff like that. Became a bit of a political activist, it sounds like. Very political. And at that point, the Apple II came out and the Sinclair Spectrum and the Commodore 64. Yeah. And I became obsessed with how you could use technology to drive an agenda. Yeah. I had an Amstrad. Do you remember the Amstrad or it came out oh, right, yeah. in, oh, yeah. came out right in that same phase? That was my first big one that I remember impacting me. Yeah, the Amstrad was great, actually. Yeah. I bought my brother one. My brother, it's a good example of the problem, by the way. My brother was left school at 15, was considered to be, the British word for it is dunce. He was considered to be a duck. I knew he was really clever because the jokes he told were really complex and funny. Yeah. So I bought him an Amstrad. He was a taxi driver. Yeah. I bought him an Amstrad and he programmed the whole taxi office, including building in an algorithm that gave him 10% more than every other driver. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and he went on to be a CTO of a public company. Amazing. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. I love that. So the idea that people are stupid, mm -hmm. it's such a terrible idea. Well, it's just like, I think people confuse intellectual intelligence with its emotional intelligence, just their ability to project themselves. You get these really introverted people that are brilliant and maybe people don't understand how 
to value their intelligence, which strangely, I think is something that's really changed over the last you know, 20, 30 years in particular, where these kind of minds in the world of technology are so much more valued. You know, so you get all of this tech. What do you start doing with it? My first real use of tech was a Tandy TRS-80, which was a huge black and white screen box with a clunky keyboard. I used a spreadsheet called Multiplan. A Multiplan had the characteristic that you could name rows or columns or even cells, and you could link spreadsheets together. So the very first thing I did was build a spreadsheet per month for distributing political books to bookstores mm -hmm. and pulling them all into an annual accounts screen that, that you could then file your taxes from, which sounds super boring. Mm -hmm. The same year, something a bit more interesting, uh, me and a friend, his name is Norman Lewis. He's very well known in the UK still these days and Russell Grinkler, we ran the typesetting machine for a weekly newspaper called The Next Step. And our writers used Commodore 64s to write stories. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you could only get things from a Commodore into a typesetter by retyping them. Mm -hmm. So we built a, an interface using RS-232, which is an old-fashioned connection. And we built a markup language, a little bit like XML is today, mm -hmm where you could spit the story out of the Commodore 64 into the typesetting machine electronically, and it would know what a headline was, what a story was, what italic and bold and subhead and all of that. So we automated typesetting from computer writing before anyone. Just out of interest. Was this a political magazine that you were doing this for? Yeah, yeah. The next step was, I'll shock you all now, it was the Revolutionary Communist Party, of which I was a central committee member. <laughs> and the weekly newspaper was called The Next Step. And we had a glossy magazine that sold 25,000 copies a month on in WH Smith's. And the glossy magazine was called LM, which was a disguise. It was living Marxism. And LM eventually got sued by the news organization ITN and, and turned bankrupt. So it's like, uh, you probably are familiar with Private Eye. Mm -hmm. It was very like a more political version of Private Eye. So first off, politics and your political activism effectively led to your path to getting into technology. Completely. You know, what really happened is politics changed. The era of Margaret Thatcher and the miners' strikes and the steelworker strikes, when it looked as if the UK might be able to be transformed by the masses, if you like. The opposite happened. Margaret Thatcher completely destroyed any sense of trade unionism. Mm -hmm. And Britain became a mini America where everyone is an individual. Mm -hmm. No longer any sense of us, it's me. Now, America's way more extreme in that than Britain, mm. but Brit Britain didn't used to be that at all. Britain was more... Especially post-war, I think there was a strong sense of we, and I felt like I watched that as I was growing up. You know, obviously, there's a, a slight age gap difference between us, but like I used to feel like I noticed it even when I was younger. I have to ask, though, if you could go back in time and talk to you know that version of you who is co-chairman of a communist group, how do you think that person would feel about future Keith taking companies public and being quite the incredible entrepreneur. Could you think you could have guessed that would have happened? Well, future Keith has worked out a whole rationale to make <laughs> everything, good. everything appear to be completely linear. <laughs> 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 but I think Keith then, you know, honestly, I thought the world could change massively in that period between the Vietnam War and Thatcher and Reagan. I think all young people thought the world was going to change. Mm -hmm. in a good way. I mean, look at America. The civil rights movement was replaced by, can we have a black president? Now, obviously, it's great that we can have a black president, but an individual can't change the world. The civil rights movement did, massively so. When you think of that John Lennon era and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, those were societal earthquakes happening because large numbers of people didn't want things to be the way they were. We see a glimmer of that today with the reaction to Roe versus Wade being reversed by the Supreme Court. 
where especially women, but not only women, are once again active together, something for all of them. And that kind of went, and we got individualism. So I think Keith back then was part of the times, and I think Keith now is part of the times. I'm a bit of an individualist these days. Mm. I don't do political activism anymore. I do try to change things, but I try to change things through what I do as an individual with teams. Mm. And honestly, I think that I agree with Marx that capitalism is the best society human beings have so far produced. And I actually think that capitalism can evolve into something beyond capitalism through its success. I think by being successful, capitalism actually destroys itself. Think of things like ChatGPT today, Mm -hmm. which is probably going to replace lots of jobs. Now, if you have an old-fashioned Marxist view of the world, losing jobs is a bad thing. Mm. If you have an understanding of progress and the division of labor, it's always been about losing jobs by making technology do things that humans previously had to. And the benefit you get is less working hours. The eight-hour working day is not the end of human leisure time. Mm. Eventually automation can produce a lot of leisure time Mm -hmm. think about i don't know how much you talk about this on your show but your dad's airline in 66 Mm -hmm. coincided with normal people being able to travel yeah because they had more leisure time it's true and i think leisure time actually is the kpi of human existence (laughs) that that is the kpi And, and so i think capitalism can give us that As long as there is one but, there is one huge but, nation states are our worst enemy because they don't let that flourish. Nation states have so much self-interest in in preserving their power that they often act to slow down these changes and they compete with each other and sometimes they have wars. That's probably the biggest glitch in capitalism, that it's organized as a series of nation states that compete with each other. Mm. And that leads to destruction every now and then. But aside from that, capitalism has everything to create the change that we all need. As long as you imagine the future and then build it, and then you're allowed to make money from it, that then builds the next stage and so on and so forth. I think it's a good thing. And actually, I don't think that's inconsistent with a proper reading of Marx, to be honest. So I was going to save this for later, but I think the timing is right. You have a series that you've been producing. It seems like it's both kind of written format and video format called That Was The Week. And you've been doing it for a while now. You can find it on Substack and subscribe there. And you kind of talk about whatever is really interesting for you in any given moment of that week. Obviously, chat GPT and AI in a more broad sense has been really, really, really topical lately. And I just finished watching today a chat between Reid Hoffman and Sam Altman, you know, the founder of ChatGPT, and they were talking about what he saw as the future. And a big chunk of that was saying, look, I think about where this is going. And he feels very strongly that this could be one of the most disruptive technology changes we've seen in quite a considerable amount of time. And that this could have profound impacts on jobs, the economic impact, whether that's efficiency in creating huge amounts of opportunity and revenue for existing companies by making them more powerful, but also an economic impact on everyday people and potential either loss or change of how the workforce works. And his belief was that when you look at the future, that ultimately this will lead to the betterment of society, that whether it's you know, leisure time, I think as Sam Altman described it as kind of humans, yes, we go through these periods of disruption, but we do have this ability to refocus our time in the 60s, kind of finding this ability for travel. You can imagine different periods of time for the Industrial Revolution as certain things happen and workers are displaced then. And what was so interesting about where I think AI is, is that so many people assumed that when you started talking about, oh, well, you know, AI is going to come, it's going to blow up all the blue collar workers first. And then it will be, you know, maybe like the lower level white collar jobs. And then, you know, maybe the more senior 
white collar jobs like programming and so on. And then maybe, maybe one day it will get to these really human things like creativity. And that's even beyond programming. They're feeling it's the inverse of that is happening. Actually, the first thing that's getting whacked now is these really, I don't want to say whacked, is another word, disruptive, you know, is these highly creative jobs. I never would have dreamt that I could program, but it's writing code. And actually the harder things to produce are actually a lot of the more manual things. Yes, we have robotics in place, but it's not able to do it at the way that these other tools are, and at the way that they can become accessible. You know, I guess when you think about what the future might look like, how do you daydream about it? Let's assume this disruption does happen. Yeah. How does society get better? Well, I think there's no inevitability about society getting better. I think society getting better is one of the choices the human race has to make because it's also possible it gets worse. It really comes to where technology and progress, which I define as freeing human beings from the need to work, meets ownership. So Sam Altman's a very interesting guy because he has a project called WorldCoin as well as ChatGPT. And WorldCoin answers the question, how do people eat and live in a world of no jobs? The root of WorldCoin is the idea of universal basic income. And at the root of that is the idea of taxing profits. And the taxation level is determined by how much human labor is involved. So the less human labor is involved, the more the tax. It basically means progress creates more societal wealth, not individual wealth. Mm. Now, that is quite revolutionary, and I suspect will not be easily accepted. I can't mm. imagine Mark Zuckerberg agreeing to give up ownership of the profit of Facebook just because it's good for society. Mm. So basically... More Warren Buffett's. <laughs> more Bill right. Gates's. Yeah. So I do think that technology and progress, which comes out of capitalism, mm. ultimately asks the question whether private ownership of profits can survive mm. from a societal point of view. And Sam asked those questions. I mean, and he's a determined capitalist. So he's very thoughtful and very self-aware, I think. So I think the future is unknown in that that is a social and human question. And human beings are completely capable of giving the wrong answers. Mm. So you really have to talk about this openly and get consensus on what you want the future to be. I do believe that we're now in a place where we can decide what we want the future to be and make it happen, but we have to want it. Yeah, there's a scary thought that when you start thinking about the implications of it, that the people that may profit the most off AI aren't actually doing any of these jobs. They may not have a job at all. They're going to just be an extraordinarily wealthy person backed or an investment group that maybe backs this technology, then this puts you in a spot where it kind of increases the haves and haves nots because the uber wealthy are getting even more extraordinarily wealthy because they are able to effectively replace so much human work. At the same time, in a more idealistic and hopeful future, you know, those same kind of AI tools that we're using to disrupt this work could also be used to help with you know, governance and distribution of wealth to make sure that things are more equitable in the future. And yeah. um, I thought that was really, really interesting. Well, but that leads you to trusting governments. Hmm. You know, my wife's South African and I'm guessing you and me are similar in this way. We both well-traveled. Not all governments are equally trustworthy. That is uh, very fair. If you're going to tax wealth produced by technology rather than by humans at a high rate, you then got to trust that governments will spend it. Got to trust the system. Yeah. yeah. So that's where this world of blockchain and autonomous organizations for governance starts to get super interesting. I have a colleague who calls it democracy 3.0, but it's where do citizens get to make decisions about allocation of resources okay. using technology where governments are simply expediters or executors of those decisions as opposed to owning the decisions themselves. So it's the move to more direct democracy using platforms that are capable of delivering it trustworthily, where governments are no longer decision makers, but are civil servants. Mm. Now, you know, that's a whole separate conversation, but I, I don't believe 
that as wealth grows, and wealth always grows, even if it goes up and down in short windows, as wealth grows, meaning the ability to produce the means of life grows, and everybody on the planet really can expect to have a decent standard of living, allocation of resources is going to become the main question. Yeah, I think when you start talking about that at scale, technology becomes super important because, again, if you can create a system that lacks bias and things like that, that sits at the root of the technology, assuming the technology can't be manipulated. I mean, at a smaller scale, I really believe, as you do, I love capitalism and passion, man. I'm obviously a serial entrepreneur. I sort of describe myself as an entrepreneur's entrepreneur because I'm so passionate about it. But I also think that capitalism has to evolve. I think it was so interesting that you said earlier that apparently Marx thought that capitalism was amazing and he just thought that it was worried about its long-term future. So I'm definitely going to be reading up on that later. I thought that was fascinating. But lately I've been really speaking more and more openly about my belief of the collective model, which I'm you know, writing a book now called Collective Capitalism. And it's this idea that capitalism is still the primary way that we should be thinking about building wealth and value and you know, foundation for a society, but that we have to find more of this concept of finding more we and less me and finding some kind of alignment where people can create more equitable terms for each other by working together towards common goals. There are still have found impact for people to succeed, but they, more people have a voice in it. And so I'm trying to find a way of communicating, like putting a real system to it, because yeah. my dream is that one day, tens of thousands of companies have taken inspiration from this book about how they might be able to shift the way they run their company. And it's actually how we run Chameleon Collective today. I think Signal Rank fits into that very well. I mean, to break it down, Signal Rank is using, I'm going to label it AI as a short form. To be honest, I don't think it is yet AI. I think it's more like a logical data model, but it's using computers to make decisions about which companies have the most promise and to make that decision very early in the life of the company, which is what venture capitalists typically do. We've built a machine that does it better than venture capitalists. Just to give a sense of it, in a 10 year test, the machine picked 230 or so unicorns. The best venture capitalists picked 77 in the same time frame. It's, it's super good. It's really, really good. One in three of the companies' picks turn into billion-dollar companies. It's amazing. Now, if we just thought of this individually, as I raise capital to deploy into these companies, I can get super rich. And so can my team. And so can the investors who buy the shares now whilst we're a private company. That would be a bit short-sighted because what you're really doing is you're getting machines to deploy capital to make gains. What you should really do is let everyone participate in that. And in capitalism, the only way to do that is to create a public corporation, a bit like Berkshire Hathaway mm -hmm. company that holds all these assets, but let anybody buy and sell the shares. Now, there's no such thing really as a publicly listed private company asset owner. In fact, the US laws, the Investment Act and others, the Companies Act, try very hard to prevent that because they don't want normal people owning private shares due to the risk implied. Mm -hmm. Now, if we've removed risk, you know, the rationale for preventing normal people owning goes away. Obviously, you can never get rid of all risk, but we've massively reduced the risk. So single rank is going to end up being a publicly listed company as fast as possible. I think that's probably about three years from now. Most of the life of the company then will be available to the public to benefit from. Now, that isn't really collective capitalism because I'm having to use the existing mechanisms to mm -hmm. achieve it. I think you and me could probably both imagine better ways of achieving the same end result. If but you were, it sounds like you're trying to work within the system that's there to make it reality. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of what you have to do if you want to be practical. Mm -hmm. If you really want to make something happen, you have to use what's there. Mm -hmm. You can't wait until you've changed the rules. I think that's a pragmatic kind of view. And I think ChatGPT will have to make the same pragmatic decisions. Sam Altman is, I can tell by listening to him, he's puzzling through 
how to use the wealth that it's going to produce to create more good. I think I've tried to do that my whole career, and it is not easy. I mean, if you think what I did, I did Siberia, which was the first internet cafe where normal people could come and use the internet before they knew what it was. Then I did EasyNet, which made it possible to use your Windows computer for the internet, which meant it came open to everyone. Then I did Real Names. Real Names was allowing non-English characters to be used as web addresses. So if you spoke Arabic or Chinese or Japanese or Russian, you could use your own character set. So I always tried to use technology to break down constraints, but you have to do it within the rules, otherwise you lose, like say Napster ultimately lost. But we wouldn't have iTunes and Spotify if there hadn't been a Napster. Mm -hmm. It's okay to lose sometimes, but ultimately if you want to win, you've got to figure out how to use the existing system to win. One of the themes I'm hearing, and I think this is a good message for anyone watching our ship or listening on many of our on of our streaming platforms. If you're an entrepreneur or a capitalist, this is a big, big theme of today. I think that it's possible to say, look, for me to win, everyone else doesn't have to lose. And so I like this idea that everything can be mutually beneficial and that you you can be a successful capitalist and at the same time still try and make the world a better place. And if you can do both those things at the same time, then that's awesome, simply put. So at this point in the show, you've just talked about a lot of the amazing things you've done throughout your career. I think it's the perfectly appropriate time to ask you for your O ship story. As I like mm-hmm. to kind of set the tone when I ask for this every week, when you think about the O ship story, I love hearing from successful people who have had a moment where maybe things have gone a bit off. You know, maybe it was an investment gone wrong. Maybe it was a client situation gone wrong. Or poise, whatever it is, something that tested you as a business owner, as a leader, as a human being. And could have been just for a moment, could have been something that tests you of long periods of time. Sometimes this can be inspiring. Sometimes this can be something funny. Whatever it is, our audience loves to hear from brilliant people about how they dealt with moments of adversity, or as we like to call them, oh ship moments. If you got one, two, whatever, if you've got a great story, I'd love to hear it. Over to you, yeah. Keith. Well, if you haven't got hundreds of those stories, you haven't really lived, have you? So <laughs> exactly right. There's one story, it's, it's super private. I've never actually told it, but the story of TechCrunch is kind of an oh shit moment. TechCrunch was founded in 2005 uh, by Mike Arrington. And Mike and I at that time were partners in Archimedes Labs. I think we called it Archimedes Ventures then. Like any two person partnership, we had a a division of the spoils. Uh, Mike was the 25% owner and I was a 75% owner because at that time he was a young rising star and I was kind of the more senior of the two of us. And within Archimedes Ventures, we created TechCrunch, Mike did, not me, and Edgeo, the company you mentioned earlier. And I ran Edgeo and Mike ran TechCrunch. Mike's super good. I don't know anyone that works harder than him, and he's very smart, and he's very focused. So he turned TechCrunch into a must-read very, very quickly. I kind of was probably best described as his mentor, but the majority shareholder in Archimedes Ventures which owned all of TechCrunch at that time. So it became very clear very quickly that Mike, who is super driven, was not happy with the fact that his work was largely owned by me. And there was a moment where we could have had a big falling out about it. And so we spoke and I knew for sure he deserved ownership in the thing he was building. And the fact that we were partners in Archimedes really shouldn't trump the truth about who was doing the work and where the value was. I suggested that we reverse the ownership, that he gets 75 and I get 25. Wow. Uh, And because we also had Edgeo, you know, I'd be 75, 25 in Edgeo and he'd be 75, 25 in TechCrunch. And he said, no, I think you should only have 10%. And we could have had a big fight. But I shook his hand and said, agreed. By the way, we never signed anything. And when TechCrunch was sold later, I was the 10% owner. And so he was true to his word. So that was a super, super difficult moment where 
compromise was required and it needed to come from me. Clearly, economically, it changed things quite a lot. Now, later on, rolling the clock forward to about 2017, I was pretty well known as the co-founder of TechCrunch. Co-founder usually conjures up somebody who's working in the business, and I wasn't. Me and Mike were both pretty active in the crypto space, working with companies who were doing initial coin offerings. And I was widely being described as the co-founder of TechCrunch. And I woke up one morning in London to a blog post from Mike saying there's only one founder of TechCrunch, scathingly trying to ridicule the idea that I was a co-founder in public. And Mike is a passionate guy. He's prone to doing things like that at the moment of anger. So my colleagues all called me and said, have you seen this? I called him and said, what are you thinking? I mean, Mike, I have share certificates. What are you doing? He said, look, I can't have you taking credit for my work. And I said, go and read my LinkedIn. I've never taken credit for your work. I've always acknowledged the facts. I said, you know, let's talk tomorrow when you wake up. So we talked later that day in the UK in his morning. In the meantime, came up with a kind of a measured response and suggested that he call me a founding shareholder. I'm fine to be not called a co-founder, yeah. but a founding shareholder. So we agreed on that. We both published the outcome literally 24 hours later. I wouldn't say we're still friends. I think Mike doesn't talk to me that much these days. Mm -hmm. But we certainly didn't become enemies, which we could have done. So that's a couple of times. And both were super personal and super difficult. And I will say, I think he was in the right mostly both times. Mm -hmm. So it was on me to understand that and fix it. First off, I really appreciate you sharing something so personal. It's a cool moment. I love this. I listen to you and you're just such a well-spoken, level-headed guy. I was thinking to myself as you're talking, I love you've got this interesting balance. Maybe it's that shyness you described for your childhood of this guy who likes to kind of rage against the status quo, but you don't apply that rage in the way that you ever deal with people. And I don't know if that's something that you acquired with age and experience or if that's something that's kind of in your DNA, but I think approaching that in such a humble way, I think is really commendable. And I think it's something that other people could really benefit from doing. It's really easy things get heated. God knows I've said some things I really, really regret over the years when I have these kind of moments of rage myself. And also I find that ego can be a very funny thing. And I don't mean ego as in the instant negative connotations that might come around that. I'm talking about ego as in our own self-perception that we all have of ourselves. And it can play funny tricks on you, I've noticed. And certainly my confidence or whatever has led me to make some silly mistakes over the years, either in how I've dealt with people or even just business or life decisions, really looking at the standing back and looking at the big picture and being able to approach things with humility and understanding what the real outcomes that really matter. Like that's something I think every leader, entrepreneur and person should just be thinking about. So thank you again for sharing that. That was great. Yeah, I think you alluded there may have been a second one that if you're on a no ship roll. <laughs> well, the, the second one was way more economically dramatic. Um, I'd love, love, love to hear it. Real Names was a company that I started in 97. The inspiration for it came from opening up EasyNet in Paris and realizing that the entire French advertising system was built on something called Minitel. So a French company would have a Minitel address like 3615 Pizza. Therefore, the internet with URLs was a worse world because no one could remember a URL, but they could remember 3615 Pizza. And every French household had a keyboard with a screen that was the yellow pages of Minitel. Yeah. So I created this system that let a Minitel address be typed into a browser and the URL would magically come for the same company. And that was like a translation between a keyword and a URL. And it quickly occurred to me that this had more universal applicability than just Minitel addresses, especially in countries that didn't have Latin characters. 
Yeah, uh, I have to be honest, this challenge never even really dawned on me until living in China. And then it kind of you realize you're like, oh yeah, none of the stuff even works for them, at least the way I've right. thought about the internet my entire life. Right. So the word invented is a bit of an overkill here because it's such a simple idea, but I did patent it. It was the idea of internet keywords. You can create keywords and map them to URLs. And the nice thing about the internet, so take a simple keyword like Ford Explorer, a model of Ford car. If you're typing that in Beijing, you want it to go to the website of the Beijing dealer for a Ford Explorer and every city in the world different. So having a single keyword aware of geography and able to go dynamically go to URL, it's like better than search. With search, you just get every result and have to figure out which one to click on. With real names, it literally just went there. And so we did things like FedEx. You could type a FedEx number in real names and get the package details, which you can still do today on, in Google, but we invented it. Everyone loved it. Alta Vista built it into Alta Vista as a search tool. That all, the results always came at the top if there was a match. Then Larry and Sergey called me and they wanted it built into Google. So we built it into Google. They called it, I'm feeling lucky. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. Of course. Yeah. Then I uh, Microsoft, that's a connection there. And so how did this go wrong for you? Well, I'm going to tell you that. So then Microsoft called and said, we want to put it in the browser okay. worldwide, which led to me doing a deal with the Chinese government, government of Japan. Wow. The Chinese government paid me $10 per keyword per year. So it was everywhere. It was ubiquitous by 1998, late 98, it was ubiquitous. I'd raised $130 million of venture capital in a year. We were a unicorn and Morgan Stanley filed us to go public. The bubble burst, so we didn't go public, but that is not the oh ship story. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> uh, I succeeded in raising money in late 2000 when no one could. And real names both survived and got profitable. In 2002, Microsoft called me and said, we want to close you down. I said, well, why? They said, well, Google has got this search engine and it has search results and they sell ads on every page. You're too good. The fact that people type in a keyword and go to a website means there's no search results and no web page and therefore no ads. We want to compete with Google. And I said to them, well, you're nuts. You've got something better than Google. You own every word in every language in the world. Yeah. Why would you want to do a worse job? And uh, they Funny, said, baby. well, because, because we want to build a search engine. I said, well, you're nuts. Anyway, I couldn't change their mind. And they closed us down. And I did an interview with Don Clark at, at the Wall Street Journal. And he wrote a whole page about it. And the chief architect of Microsoft, Ed Lee, wrote, saying, Keith T is right, Microsoft shouldn't close this down. And Bill Gates called him up and said, you know, you crossed the line there. Then Steve Barmer flew to Silicon Valley to speak to all my VCs to kind of semi-apologize, but say, we're not going to change our mind. Wow. So the whole thing blew up. And that's when I did my first blog. Dave Weiner taught me about blogs. He's the owner of weblogs.com then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I got a million readers in a week. Talking mm -hmm. about how stupid Microsoft was being. But that billions of dollars of value turned into zero overnight. Wow. Unreal. Keith, you had some incredible adventures throughout your career. I feel like you're not anywhere close to done, especially with the things you're working on with Signal Rank. I didn't even get through a third of the things I wanted to talk to you about today just because I enjoyed digging into your stories so much. But for people that want to follow you or stay connected to you, what's the best way to do that? Probably my Twitter, which is my first initial K and my second name Tier, K Tier, T E A R E. I post uh, every story that is going to be selected for that was the week goes into my Twitter stream live. So it's a way of, you can even not read my newsletter if you don't want, just by reading my Twitter stream. It's all there, yes. apart from my editorial. And that's the best way, I think.
And another great way to find Geek is at checking out his company, Signal Rank. I spent a considerable amount of time geeking out on signalrank.co last night, and I encourage you guys to do the same. For all of you tuning in right now, whether you're watching the show on video or listening in to any of our audio podcasts, thank you, thank you, thank you for subscribing and listening to us. The best way you can support the show, give us a like, share us on your social feeds, tell your friends about it. This is a show we do just because we're passionate about bringing really great minds to all of you. We will never commercialize this web series. And the best thing you can do to continue to support us and bring you great content every single week is subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And easy ways to find all the different places we stream is visit us at oshipshow.com. Keith, thank you again for your time. I really enjoyed getting to know you. I want to stay in contact. And I look forward to spending time with you in the future in person one day, hopefully. And Thanks, Oship. Thanks, followers. See you soon. See you next week on O-Ship. Oh,